back. I was not here last week. Um, I'm actually here live in person this week. And see, look here. Um, so Pam won't be as close as she was to you last week. Um, <laughs> she's laughing in the background. We want to thank you for joining us. She will thank you um, when she comes out because we are grateful, very grateful that we have you guys here watching us. And, and I love Pam's teaching. And to be a part of it, I'm like, oh, I get to see it in person. Um, so I just feel very blessed. Um, we had a conversation this morning, and we were talking about what's going on around us. And, you know, I see so much focus put on the COVID situation that I just I don't want to put any more focus on that. What I do want to put um, focus on this was a statement that someone made to me. They were like, oh, my gosh, how long do we go on suffering like this? And I kind of was taken aback because though it's different and it's uncomfortable, we're not, well, it's not that it's uncomfortable for some people, but it, we're not suffering. We're not suffering. We're inconvenienced Amen. right now. And I think it's really important to notice because, you know, people are getting the groceries delivered to their homes still um, in some areas of the country. And people are able to go out now in some areas of the country and eat in a restaurant within, you know, with certain guidelines. There's some people that can't ever leave their homes. And we're lucky because we're able to worship the Lord and get our Bible lessons, and that is a blessing. So focus on your blessings during this time and just realize it is not a suffering that we're going through. Um, it is still an inconvenience, but what a great one it is to spend time with our family and just be home and be situated and get to spend more time with the Lord and writing and singing and looking to Him. So instead of looking at the chaos right now, shut off the world. And <clears throat> focus on him. Just give, give him all that you can. Actually, we should give him all that we are. And so just do your best to focus in on this.
several months ago, and God's uh, presence just kept bringing me back and bringing me back, and He wouldn't let me go from this event that I was studying just in my personal reading time of His Word. And so I've come back to it time and time again and prayed over it, and God has so etched His personal message in my heart for my life that what I needed to respond, how I needed to respond, and the changes that I needed to make. And uh, this event, this passage, brought me to my knees before the Lord. And in that process, it's, it's been a couple of months now, but in that process, God just keeps bringing me back. And I want to take you to this place in Scripture where God took me. And I have prayed for you, for all that would hear, that you would respond accordingly, that you would respond how God would want you to. We all have a basis of faith, a statement of upon which we live and how we live day to day, behind closed doors, in times of adversity, loss and death and pain and suffering. All of those things will expose what we really believe in our faith and what we stand on. Martin Luther King Jr. said, the true measure of a man is not how he behaves in moments of comfort and convenience, but how he stands, or she, how he or she stands in times of controversy and challenge. Well, King David, when we look into scripture, King David was a man of great faith. He was king over Israel. He was God's chosen king for Israel. Now, David was not a perfect man by far. He had his faults. He had his low places and his high places. He had his sufferings. He had his losses. He had his pains, his grievances. But David's faith was great. He was a man of faith. And I want us to look at that statement of faith before we get into the message that God has for us tonight because it's important. And we find that for us in 2 Samuel chapter 23 in the first four verses. This is David's statement of faith, and it was written in the latter years of his life. And after he makes this statement of faith, an event happens, and that's going to be what we're going to camp in tonight, that event. But his statement of faith preceded it. Now these are the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, declares, this is his declaration, this is his statement of faith, and he's speaking of himself. He said, the man who was raised on high, declares, the anointed one of God, the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel, the spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel, Jesus, spoke to me. He, Jesus, who rules over men righteously, who rules in the fear of God, is as the light of the morning when the sun rises, a morning without clouds, when the tender grass springs out of the earth through sunshine after rain. Truly, is not my house so with God? For he has made an everlasting covenant with me, ordered in all things and secured. For all my salvation and all my desire, will he not indeed make it grow? Now that's David's statement of faith. In times of challenge, in times of controversy, all of these things, all these difficulties in life will bring to the forefront, it will expose, it will reveal, it will unveil for all to see the reality of our faith. What is it that we really believe? What is it that we really believe? Now, right after this, and this is where we're camping in our time together. And by the way, I'm so thankful that you tuned in. We're 2 Samuel chapter 24, and this same event is found in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. And so I'm going to refer over there, and, but we're basically going to camp right here. It's the same event. But it was a time, let me set the stage for you. Israel, God's people, God's chosen people, they had sinned again. They had... Uh, turned away from God countless times, and God would always bring them through and turn them back around and bring them to a place of repentance. And this is the same setting here when we begin reading in chapter 24. And it says, now again, the key word being again, now again the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. 
And it incited David against them to say, Go number Israel in all of Judah. Go number all of God's people. And so he sends one of his commanders, one of his leading men by the name of Joab, to go from one end of the land to the other, everywhere except certain in the city, in the center, and where they went out. And he says, I want you to go from one end of the land to the other, and I want you to number my men, my valiant men. You say, well, why was that so bad? Because it ended up bringing Israel to a very difficult place with God. Israel was already in sin, but David saw it, and David, out of his anger and in his emotion, it tempted him. If we go to 1 Chronicles chapter 21, it says that the devil, that Satan, incited his heart to sin by numbering the people. He said, well, what made that so bad? And our first point together that we're going to see tonight is the heart, the heart of sin. What's at the heart of sin? And what was at the heart of this sin with David that brought the whole nation to such a difficult place? And we're going to get to that place. He sent out Joab to number. If we turn to Exodus chapter 30, that's the second book of the law of Israel. It warns against numbering. It warns against numbering the people. Because when you numbered the people, this speaks of God's ownership. In the ancient cultures, in biblical times, a man only had the right to count, to number, to take inventory of what belonged to him. And you see, David, David, when he had Israel numbered, Israel didn't belong to David. They weren't, they weren't his. He had no ownership over them, but he had them numbered, which went against God's word, as if it were his. If, as, if, as if everything before him belonged to him. It was under his control. He was the owner. Well, this was a great sin, a grievous thing in the eyes of God for many reasons. Not just an, an ownership, but because he turned to look at the physical strength. Well, we're in a bad place, so let me see what we have. So when we go to the next battle, I need to know what our personal strengths are. Do you know where his eyes were at? His eyes were on what he owned and what his own strengths were, his own resources. Meaning, God, we don't need you anymore. We just need what we have. This is ours. It's not yours. So ownership changed. But his eyes, his vision, his view changed. It went from looking at God to meet his needs, his resources, and all, that, all the, the power that he needed to defeat the enemies that they were constantly in battle against. Everything that he needed, he took his eyes off of God and he put it on what was in front of him. You see, that was the heart of the sin of David. He looked and saw everything that he had, everything that his hand could control, everything that his hand could touch. He saw it as belonging to him. Rather than everything belongs to God. Nothing is ours. That's the birthplace right there of sin. When we forget who is the one on the throne, who's the owner of all things. And King David did that. He took his dependency away from God. He took his focus off of God. And he began thinking that actually these things are mine. You see, we don't own anything. Our homes, our finances, our businesses, ministries, churches, communities, positions, talents, all of our resources, our children, our grandchildren, our spouses, we don't own any of those things. They all belong to God. Amen. And the day that we begin to number what is ours, we've removed God from his position, his rightful position of ownership of all things. Well, this grieved the heart of God very much. But David was convicted as soon as the numbering was over. And we're going to drop down to verse 10. And it said, now David's heart troubled him after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I've sinned greatly in what I've done. David's heart is a beautiful picture of repentance here. As soon as he acted, as soon as he, he did what he knew he shouldn't have done, he went against the book of the law, he went against God's word, it bothered him greatly. And he goes to God and says, what I've done, I'm so sorry. It has troubled my heart. I'm so sorry for what I've done. Our sins should be a grievance to us. Yeah. You know, it's not that we won't ever 
uh, disobey God in things. It's not what, that we won't ever fail God, but it's how we respond in those moments mm -hmm. afterwards. And yes. David knew that God loved him, and David knew that God was for him, not against him. And so he goes to God as a child to a father, and he says, I have sinned greatly in what I've done. I recognize it. He took accountability. You see, we can't blame mm. others for our sins. We have to take accountability for what we've done. We alone are accountable for our actions. And this was a king. This was the beloved king, David. And David says, I take responsibility. I have sinned greatly in what I have done. It's not like he went to, it would have been very easy. He didn't go to God and say, now listen, this people that I'm ruling over, remember they were already in sin. <laughs> And David could have very easily went to God and made it about Israel and made it about their sin. Have you ever done that? Have you ever gone to God when you know you've blown it and you've gone and you've said, well, if it wasn't for so-and-so and what they had done, if it wasn't for this situation, if it wasn't for this people, if it wasn't for, for, for this body of believers, I wouldn't have acted the way I did. David never brought up their sin before God, even though the people were in sin before David did this. Now, David took sole responsibility. And we're going to keep reading. He said, I have sinned greatly, but now, O Lord, verse 10, please take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have acted so foolishly. When David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and speak to David. Thus says the Lord, I am offering you three things. Choose for yourself one of them which I may do to you. To you, not to the people, but to you. So I want us to see the consequences, this personal sin, the price of sin, which is our second point together. If we see the heart of the sin, but the second is the price of the sin. You know, we never think about the, the, the consequences many times when we make the decisions to go against what God's word says or when we know the right thing to do. We don't respond godly. We respond in emotion, which is exactly what David did. He was in his emotions. He was angry. He was disappointed with the people. And he was in a situation where he acted out almost in vengeance. And so he's come to God. He's owned up. He's not blamed it on the people. But God said, David, which is very very merciful and gracious on God's part. He said, I'm going to give you three choices. I'm going to give you three things to choose from. And here they are. He said, shall seven years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before your enemies while they pursue you? So seven years of famine or three months on the run from your enemies. Or shall there be three days of pestilence? And pestilence means plagues in your land. Now consider and see what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Now David has three choices before him. Then David said to Gad, he said to the prophet, I'm in great distress over this. Oh, that we would have a heart that's in distress over sin. Let us now fall into the hand of the Lord. There was such a critical hour, and God came down, and even though David's heart was repentant, and, and this is somehow where we are misled, we think as long as I go to God and I humble myself, and I say, God, I take full responsibility, I'm so sorry, God, please forgive me, and God says, yes, I forgive you, and we stand up, we go, that's over. No, it's not over. Because when we sin, there are consequences that God can't and doesn't remove. Because it's part of his order, it's part of his word, it's part of his law. And God has set that uh, ahead of us, knowing if you do this, this is the consequences that will follow. So we know going in that it's not going to be good, that we're going to have to suffer some consequences. It's not judgment, but it's the consequences of our choices. And so God comes down in great grace, in my opinion, and says, I'm going to give you three choices you choose. Do you want seven years a famine. That's a long time. Or do you want to flee before your enemies for three months? You're on the run from your enemies. Or would you have three days, or would you rather have three days of pestilence, of disease, which is translated plagues? Would you, which would you choose? And David said, I'm in great distress. Let us now fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. But do not let us fall into the hand of man. 
David understood that his consequences, the price of sin, anytime we sin, the consequences don't just affect us, they always impact and affect others. Right. It will affect our family, it will affect and impact mm -hmm. our businesses, our ministries, our churches, our communities. A sin consequence is never singular, it's always plural. And David understood this. He said, let us fall into the hand of the Lord. Not the hand of man. So David was choosing the three days of plague. So the Lord sent a plague, a pestilence upon Israel from the morning until the appointed time. And here's the sorrow. Here's the heaviness. Or David, there's that moment when you realize what your choices have cost you. Yeah. And we may not be there at the beginning, but at some point down the road of it, the hard, the hard, hard truth of what it cost hits us. And it says 70,000 men of the people from Dan to Beersheba died. From one end to the other where David had them numbered. From one end to the other. When the angel of the Lord stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem, that was everywhere but Jerusalem. When he stretched out his hand towards Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who destroyed the people, It's enough. Relax your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. God had taken David to a place where he gave him a, 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 a clear view of what his decisions, the price of his sin. And we see that one-third of the three days of this plague, this pestilence, had come about and 70,000 men had died. And he had not even struck Jerusalem yet. He hadn't even struck Jerusalem. And God saw it. God saw the consequences of that sin. That, that there was no choice on heaven's part. We made the decision. The consequences came because of our sin. Sin that we allowed to come into the world from the beginning. And it broke God's heart when he looked out and he saw the death. He saw the calamity. That means the, the chaos, the panic, the sorrow, the loss, the pain of it. God saw it and he said, hold back your hand to the angel of judgment. The angel who was striking the land of those consequences. And he said, hold back your land. So there's the, the heart of the sin. The price of the sin, but the third thing that I want us to see is the view that David got between heaven and earth. The view that David saw between heaven and earth. David's focus had changed from being in a, a place of disagreement with God, a place where his, his statement of faith didn't line up with his life. And now, all of a sudden, David sees what he couldn't see before. And he sees an angel of the Lord standing at the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. So the view between heaven and earth, and I want you to read it with me if you've got your Bible, 2 Samuel, in this chapter uh, 24, verses 16 and 17. And when the angel of the Lord had stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem, God said, hold up, it is enough. And then verse 17, then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking down the people, and he said, Behold, it is I who have sinned, and it is I who have done wrong, but these sheep, and he's talking about the people, what have they done? Please let thy hand be against me and against my father's house. So Gad came to David that day, and he said to him, Go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David went up according to the word of God, just as the Lord had commanded him. What did David see? David saw that the angel of the Lord, and I want you to understand the picture, the angel of the Lord had pulled out the sword from the sheath because the consequences had to fall. And as that sword was starting to come down, 70,000 people lost their lives. And then God said as he raises it up, to begin to swing it a second time, God says, hold up, because God's heart was breaking over the consequences of the decision of David, of the sin of the people. We have a nation that's in sin. We have a leader over the land who's in sin. 
And God says, just hold up. My heart is breaking. But as, as, as it's held up, God wanted David to understand that it's not over. There's still Jerusalem. There's still the very heart of the land. And while my arm is still up, I've relented for a moment, but it's not over. You see, this was a time where God never told David to comfort the people. It wasn't a time where God's people needed comforting, not nearly as much as they needed conviction. It wasn't an hour of comfort. It was an hour where conviction was needed. You say, Pam, that's kind of hard. Well, it's really grace and mercy. Because it's easy for us to want to just comfort, comfort, comfort in difficult times and kind of water down the truth over here. What the land needed was conviction, was the spirit of conviction, the blanket of conviction draped across the land where God could, could cause him to cry out to him, to return to him, to repent just as David had done so he could turn around and bless them once again. God wanted to bring them back to himself. Now that's mercy. That's mercy right there. And this is what had happened. And, and David understood, I see it, God. I see that you have eased up just a little, but don't let us stop right here in our pressing in and to get right with you. Because God stepped in in mercy and he said, I want you to go to the threshing floor. I'm sending you to the threshing floor. The consequences have not finished yet. The, the, the angel of the Lord still has the sword drawn from the sheath. First Chronicles 21 tells us that. Even though he had stopped, it's still out of the sheath. And he says, God's telling you to go to the threshing floor of Ornan and build an altar there. Our fourth and final point is the need for a threshing floor. The need to go to the threshing floor that God designs. Now, what is a threshing floor in biblical times? And a threshing floor was a place where they, it was usually a flat surface and usually it was elevated so they could catch the wind and they would lay the wheat down and they would beat the wheat on the floor, that threshing floor on the ground, on that flat, hard surface. And they would beat it in order to separate the chaff from the wheat. In other words, it was a place of separation to remove those things that shouldn't be there, to separate the life and the heart of the wheat from that which is, is not precious, that there's no life in it. And so it's a place of great meaning. In this specific place, it was the same place where Abraham offered up Isaac. It's the same place that the temple would be built on at God's command. So on this threshing floor, this is where wheat was beat out. And God is sending David to the threshing floor. And he tells him one thing to do at that threshing floor. I want you to build an altar there. He never tells him what to do once he builds the altar. He leaves that decision to David. Why is there a decision still at hand that David needs to make? Because the sword is still out of the sheath. David sees this. He understands it. How many of us have built altars? We have a form of worship, in other words, but there's no offering or sacrifice. Nothing's ever been laid upon it of cost, of worth. Because David does exactly what God has told him to do. And David went up according to the word of God in verse 20 of 2 Samuel 24. And Ornan looked down and he saw the king and his servants crossing over toward him. And he runs out and he bows to the ground to see David. And he says, why has my Lord come? And David says, to buy the threshing floor from you in order to build the altar to the Lord. That the plague may be held back from the people. And Ornan said to David, oh, let my Lord the king take it up. I, I offer it to you. I give it to you. And I'll give you everything to put on that altar. I'm not only going to give you the threshing floor, but I'm going to give you what you're to put on that altar to offer up to God. Everything, he said, is yours. But listen to David's answer in verse 24. However, the king, David, said to him, No, but I will surely buy it from you for a full price. For I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord to my God, which cost me nothing. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to offer anything that costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor 
and all the oxen with 50 shekels of silver. Not only did the threshing floor cost him, the altar cost him, but the offering cost him. And David built there an altar to the Lord, and he offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. Thus the Lord was moved by prayer for the land, and the plague was held back from Israel. This is a powerful place that David had found himself at. How many times have we come to the altar of God? We've come into the house of God to worship, but it's not cost us anything. We've not paid a price to be right with God, to be restored with God. Do you know what a burn offering is? Peace offering is the same understanding, but a burn offering and a peace offering, a burn offering, they're both um, voluntary offerings. They're both voluntary, but a burn offering is unique in that nothing was held back. Everything was given for God. And this is what David decides on his own free will to do. Because God never said, I want you to go to the threshing floor, this particular place. God chooses the place of our threshing. God ordains those places. We don't. But he sent David there and he said, I want you to build an altar. Well, what are altars for? Altars require sacrifice. Come on. Mm -hmm. Altars are a place that's created where worship can take place where man and God can be reconciled to one another. God said, I want to bring about and put you in a place where you can be reconciled back to me. And the people can, can come back into standing, right standing with me. But when I send you there, and I tell you that you need to build an altar, what you do with that altar is your choice. God never told David to offer up a burnt offering. God only told him to go. What you offer up there is completely up to you. Acts 3 verse 19 tells us this. If you'll repent and turn back, your sins, so your sins may be wiped out. You see, God will bring us to this place, but what we do there is completely up to us. Leonard Ravenhill said the only reason that we don't have revival in our land is because we are willing to live without it. <laughs> the only reason we don't have revival in the land is because we're willing to live without it. King David was not willing to live without revival in the land for his people. And so God brought him to the threshing floor. It takes the leader, it takes someone, a servant of God to say, I'll go, I'll recognize you brought me to this threshing floor and you said erect an altar there, but I've got to stand and say, God, what do I need to put on that altar? What needs to be threshed out here and separated from my life because it doesn't belong here anymore because you want to bring not only me back into a right standing, but you want to bring my people back into a right standing. Because you see, it wasn't David's kingship that was at stake here. It wasn't just David's life that was at stake here. It was his people. It was the land. It was God's chosen people that was at stake. And David understood the gravity of the moment. He understood that this is not the hour of comfort. It's the hour where conviction is needed, that we need to wrap ourselves in sackcloth and ashes, so to speak, and humble ourselves before God, repent and come back to Him because He's a God of love. He's a God of mercy. He's a God that is longing to forgive us. Amen. And David saw that. He saw the vision between what stood between heaven and earth, that there was that arm that was of that angel that was still outstretched. But God had said, let's just pause for a minute. John Wesley said this, Give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. And I care not whether they are clergymen or laymen. They alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven upon the earth. Mm -hmm. Upon the earth. So David comes to the threshing floor. He builds the altar as God tells him. And he pays a price any time that God brings us to a threshing floor. He brings us to a place where he wants his inner work to happen on a deep level, a level that it could not have taken place any other way. Are you willing? Are we willing? Am I willing? And this is the question that God asked me a couple of months ago. 
Are you willing to pay the price? You can't come back or in a deeper place with God to reunite with Him as we need to. It, and it costs us nothing. As a country, as an American, as a Christian, we can't return to God. We can't see revival. And it costs us nothing. Revival's not free. Amen. Calvary, salvation's not free. It costs mm -hmm. Jesus his life. And so David was brought to this place, but while he was there, while David, he falls on his knees and he offers up this burnt offering. I want you to understand, while David was on his knees, the sword was still raised. It was still raised. But what we see when God looked down, it tells us that the Lord was moved by prayer for, for the land and the plague was held back. The plague was held back. Our country and our land is in a desperate hour. We're on the hymn of change, and we're also on the hymn of judgment, I believe. The consequences to fall. The sword, I believe, is still drawn, as hard as it is for me to say that. The sword is still drawn, but God has brought us to the threshing floor. And many of us have built our altars there. We have turned to prayer, even worship. But have we repented? Have we repented? I'm asking you what God asked me. Have we offered up freely our all as a burnt offering? You see, the altars that God has us build, we're looking around what he wants. What does he want? I remember when, when I became a Christian and I went down to the altar in church and not that you have to go to the altar in the church to, to become a Christian, give your life to the Lord but I asked him to forgive me of my sins which were many and I looked around because in that moment in my mind I was looking and I was thinking, I was looking around in my mind and I said Lord you have forgiven me and I felt it I, I mean, I, I literally, physically felt it. And I said, what can I give you? I don't have talents. I don't have money. I don't have position. I wasn't even quite 18 years of age yet, coming out of high school. But I wanted something to give him. And I looked around, and the only thing that I had that I could give, because I owned nothing. I mean, you don't own anything at 18. I said, I don't own anything. But then God brought it to my mind, the one thing that you do have that nobody else can give. I said, it's me. It's my life. It's all of my days. You can have all of me. I became a burnt offering. And we all do. That's true salvation. When we become a burnt offering, we say, God, have all of me. I keep nothing of my life for myself. I give it all to you. And that's what God has brought us to this hour right now as his people. Because America, this is his country. Just as Israel is his, this was dedicated to him, not us. We've got to get out of the numbering mentality. That's why we're in the state we're in. We've numbered thinking that this land is ours. We don't own America. We don't own this land. It is his. Amen. It is all his. Our churches are his. Our families are his. All that we have is His. And if we'll come to the threshing floor with that understanding, fall on our face and come back to Him, God will relent and He will heal our land. You see, He's waiting at the threshing floor to see what we will do. You remember David's statement of faith? You remember his statement of faith? He said, Jesus' rule is as the light of the morning when the sun rises, a morning without clouds, when the tender grass shoots up from the earth through sunshine after rain. Truly is not my house, so would God. In other words, will there not be a newness that comes after the night has passed? That was his statement of faith. I want to speak to you, to those whose faith has fallen asleep given way to defeat in the face of darkness, in the face of life, then I say to you, arise, 
awake from your slumber of complacency. For the soul that has lost its way, God says, come home. And to the believer who has retreated in fear, afraid of the consequences of the hour, God says, rise. Now is the hour. For those struggling in mind, torn between loyalties, God says, choose. Choose this day whom you will serve. And for the soul who has turned its back on God and his holy word, he says, I love you. But I'm calling you to repent, to come back, to turn to me, to give your life to me, to Jesus. For all the souls of mankind, to the entire world, God says, I love you. But my word to this generation is ready yourself, for the Lord is coming. All of it is his. He's taken us to the threshing floor. And he's looking for that soul that will repent and stand in the gap. In those hard places, God wants to do an amazing work. I want to pray for us, and Jody's going to close us out in worship. And I invite you to bow your head and to search your heart, to ask God to search you. Father, thank you for your precious word. I, I lift my hands to you, O oh God because it is all yours. This country, God, is yours and yours alone. God, we ask, we know the hour is critical. The sword is not in its sheath. Not until David offered up did the sword go back. So God, call your people to pray. Calls us to rise, to search ourselves first. God, we thank you for the love and mercy you have shown us because it's not over yet. You're waiting. To you be all the glory, Father. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.